So I want to speak about tolerance, compromise, and goodwill. In relation to the problem of terrorism, Islamic Jihad, the Middle East, Europe, and Israel. So tolerance, compromise, and goodwill. In my opinion, there is too much of it. Over the years since the threat that we face has been developing and building, we in the West have made too many concessions, too many compromises. We've been too tolerant. Our, tolerant, our own tolerance is quite literally killing us. When we give up ground, our enemies naturally want to push us back even further. They want to take even more ground away from us. Two important European politicians have recently made public statements that are music to the ears of the Islamic State and other jihadists. Only last week, when visiting New York, the new mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, said that terrorist attacks were part and parcel of life in a big city. It is a reality, I'm afraid, he said, that London, New York, other major cities around the world have got to be prepared for these sort of things to happen. Khan was echoing the words in July of the French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, in the wake of the horrific attack in Nice that killed 86 people, plus the perpetrator. And Valls said, France must learn to live with terrorism. How better, how better to declare to the Islamic State that we have no answer to their violence? How better to embolden them even further? And this is in a country where more Frenchmen have been murdered by jihadists in the last year, in the last 12 months, than in the whole of the 20th century. There has been a terrorist attack in France every other month for the last 18 months. After the attacks in Paris last November, the French government made plans to get tough, to change their constitution to enable the three million Muslims with dual nationality to be stripped of French citizenship if they were convicted of terrorist offences. Even this measure has been dropped under pressure from appeasers. But France's policy of appeasement has not worked. The problem has got worse and not better. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, for France to get tough. And it is time for all of us to get tough. Our appeasement of Iran, rather than having the iron will to confront and pressurize the Ayatollahs, led to the disastrous nuclear agreement a year ago. An agreement that failed in its objectives to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear arsenal, that released to the Iranian terror state, the world's greatest state supporter of terrorism, $100 billion in unfrozen assets, and will give Iranians more billions of dollars with international economic sanctions lifted. The agreement has emboldened Iran to ever greater imperial aggression in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Yemen. And also, of course, against the State of Israel. Even during and immediately after the negotiations, Iran openly flaunted its contempt for the United States, test-launching ballistic missiles in violation of their obligations under UN Security Ra uh, Council Resolution 1929 which states that Iran shall not undertake any activity related to ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. They have threatened and taunted 
U.S. warships throughout the region. It is the same spirit of appeasement that has prevented the U.S., Britain, and their allies from dealing effectively with the Islamic State in Syria, Iraq, Libya, or in Afghanistan or Pakistan. We have been paralyzed by fear of enraging our own internal Muslim populations in our own countries and the increasingly powerful UN lobbies and human rights groups by the kind of decisive action against the Islamic State that is required to destroy them. This appeasement does not reduce the problem. It increases it. For many months now, the Islamic State has been seen to violently confront the world's only superpower and its allies and remain undefeated. It has had setbacks, including territorial setbacks, for sure. But it has not been annihilated as it could have been and as it should have been. This appearance of supremacy motivates and inspires radicalized Muslims everywhere, including in Norway and in Nice, to take up arms against the worse. More than 1,270, 1,270 Islamic terrorist attacks have been launched in, 15, in 50 different countries so far this year alone more than 1,270 attacks in this last year alone. Polls show that 42% of French Muslims aged between 18 and 29 support suicide bomb attacks. 42% of French Muslims. In the UK, it is 35% who support suicide attacks, and in the US, 26%. I'm afraid I don't have the figure for Norway. This is the influence that is being cast by the Islamic State, and it is the price of our weakness and our appeasement. More than 5,000 blooded, battle-hardened jihadists who have been fighting with the Islamic State in Syria and in Iraq, who should have been killed there, have returned to Europe. More will follow, going in both directions. Instead of barring their return, European policies of appeasement allow them to come back home, where they can put to good use against us their battle skills, their motivation, the orders to attack that they have been given by their, US, by their IS masters. Winston Churchill, with his usual pithy succinctness, said, an appeaser is one who feeds the crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. He knew from bitter experience that appeasement encourages to greater acts of violence the aggressor. This is why this is why he alone in Europe and almost alone in Britain stood against the urge to reach an agreement with the Nazis and the urgings of many senior politicians in London to agree an armistice with Hitler in 1940. It was the appeasement of Hitler in the 1930s that led to a world war, to the defeat and occupation of many European countries, including, of course, your own precious land, and the deaths of 45 million people, including at least 6 million Jews who perished in Hitler's extermination camps. In November 1941, Hitler and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the Arab leader Mohammed Amin al-Husseini had a 90-minute meeting in Berlin. There, they agreed on the extermination of the Jewish people 
in the Middle East as well as in Europe. Had Churchill not stood up to Hitler and had his military commander, General Montgomery, not stopped Hitler's imperial aggression in the Middle East at the Battle of Alamein in 1942, the Nazi Holocaust would have extended throughout the region, butchering Jews from Tehran to Tunisia. And even after the Nazi defeat, in the 1950s, officers of Hitler's SS helped to train the Palestinian terrorists, including Yasser Arafat, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, trained by the Nazis, trained in the techniques of terrorism. Among other atrocities, Arafat's terrorist arm, Black September, murdered 11 Israeli athletes and coaches at the Munich Olympics this very month in 1972. Former Nazis also provided training and support to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, who were responsible for the hijacking of Air France Flight 139, which eventually led to the greatest special forces raid in history at Entebbe 40 years ago by Israeli special forces. Before the hostages were rescued, actually I'll just pause there for a moment and mention something about that raid on Entebbe, which I told to one or two people last night, but I thought might be a little bit interesting for you. As you probably know, the raid on Entebbe was led on the ground by Yoni Netanyahu, the older brother of the current Prime Minister of Israel. And uh, I visited Yoni Netanyahu's grave in Jerusalem um, only last year, and I know it's one of the, the most visited graves in the cemetery there. Uh, I want to take you back a hundred years to the First World War. And in the First World War, there was a um, a part of the British Army which was known as the Jewish Legion. It was made up of Jews from Palestine, from Britain, from America, from Russia, and from other places in Europe. And it was a part of the British Army. They had a cap badge which was the menorah. Their, their, their uh, motto was Hatikva. I beg your pardon, their motto was um, Kadima, meaning forward in Hebrew. And their, their regimental song was the Hatikva, years before the foundation of the State of Israel. Their regimental colors were blue and white, and on their shoulders they wore the Star of David. Now, they fought in 1918 in the Battle of Megiddo in Palestine as part of Allenby's army. Um, and they helped to drive the Turks out of Palestine into Jordan, where they were ultimately defeated by the British forces there. The commander of that Jewish legion was Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Patterson, who was a British Christian officer. And after the end of the war, he, he left Palestine, went back to Britain, and then left the army and went to live in the United States of America, where he died in 1947 in, uh, in, in, uh, near Los Angeles and was buried in Los Angeles. He... Uh, his final wish, one of his final wishes, was to be buried among the soldiers he'd commanded in Palestine at the Battle of Megiddo. But in 1947, that wasn't possible. However, only last year, he was dug up, moved to Israel, and his ashes reinterred in, in the military cemetery among the soldiers he'd commanded in Israel. And the, the ceremony there of his reinterment of his ashes was presided up over... over by Prime Minister Netanyahu. Why? Because when Colonel Patterson was in America, he had become a close friend of Netanyahu's father, Benzion Netanyahu. And he came, was such a close friend that he became the godfather of Benzion's older son, Yoni. And indeed, Benzion's older son, was named after Colonel Jonathan Patterson. He was named Jonathan, or Yoni for short. And that sort of completes the circle um, of the man who commanded 
the Israeli Special Forces at what I consider to be the greatest Special Forces raid in history. I'm sorry to break out like that, but that's just a slight aside of the thought might possibly be interesting for you. Going back to Entebbe 40 years ago um, last month, before the hostages were rescued, they faced chilling scenes reminiscent of the camps where German terrorists, working with Palestinian terrorists, made selections among the passengers, pointing to Jews this way, non-Jews that way. Even today, the methods of Palestinian terrorists resonate with Nazi techniques, to whom they owe their origins to a large extent. I spoke yesterday <clears throat> of my comparison of the Gaza murder tunnels and the Auschwitz death factory. It is the recent conflicts in Gaza that Israel and her brave defenders, the IDF, have been most savagely demonized and vilified by the Arab world, by the UN, by human rights groups, and by Western governments, who instead of defending the legitimate actions of the one and only democracy in the Middle East have joined in the shrill, malevolent chorus of attack in their enthusiasm to appease, that word again, to appease the haters of the Jewish state. And their appeasement here has the same effect as appeasement in their own lands. It emboldens the terrorists and their supporters. Hamas Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the other jihadist war criminals who have the same agenda and the same doctrine as the Islamic State know that they can't defeat Israel militarily. Instead, using human shields, they deliberately force the IDF to kill their own people in order to bring down the inevitable Western pressure upon them. This is their only weapon supported by a complicit and compliant world media, which in many cases has become a fighter on the side of the Islamic State. And I don't include, I'm not talking here about fringe media in the Middle East, I'm talking about mainstream media in all of our countries. The IDF, with their greater superior Morality takes the unprecedented steps to reduce the lives of innocent civilians that I outlined to you yesterday. Yet despite their immense care to avoid civilian deaths, even at the risk of their own lives, Western leaders shamelessly parrot condemnation of these brave men. And what does this do? It spurs on the terrorists to greater, more grotesque, more bloodthirsty acts of violence. Their use of human shields, despite Israel's best efforts at minimizing deaths, leads inevitably to the killing of more and more Palestinian civilians. The international outcry that follows encourages Hamas and their jihadist bedfellows to repeat the tactic again and again and again. And this in turn leads to even more deaths. Those who unjustly condemn Israel in the face of these disgusting jihadist tactics, they have blood on their hands. The situation is compounded by Western leaders themselves swallowing their own messages of appeasement paralyzing themselves as they do, and neutralizing their own military forces in the face of human shields used by the Islamic State, the Taliban, and jihadists everywhere around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a vicious circle that cannot be broken, except by the abandonment of this dangerously corrosive appeasement and the adoption by us of a hard line against our enemies. 
This whole attitude extends to every aspect of Western military and security operations, where self-destructive caution and fatal weakness prevail. This weakness is not only recognized by our enemies, but also by the civilian populations who we're trying to win over in the different conflict zones such as Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. These people in these countries, they respect strength. They despise weakness. And consequently, our efforts at winning over hearts and minds are nullified, neutralized by our own feebleness. As Bin Laden himself said, when people see a strong horse and a weak horse, they will like the strong horse. The same Western appeasement extends from Gaza into the war that Israel is fighting today on her own streets, even only a couple of days ago when we saw further stabbing attacks. The stabbings, knifings, car rammings, shootings and bombings that Israel has endured for months are the responsibility of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, the supposedly moderate leader. Yet in a report published recently, the EU blamed, by the way, Abbas, if you didn't realize, helped to fund, helped to finance the, um, the Munich Olympics attack, a moderate leader. So in a report published recently, the EU blamed the so-called Israeli occupation of the West Bank for the violence, and even condemned Israel's efforts to prevent the attacks from happening. What better way of encouraging further violence against Israeli citizens to justify it in the, United, in the EU? It is not only uh, Abbas's poisonous anti-Israel, anti-Jew propaganda spewed out by his Palestinian authority in their official reports, in their official publications funded by you and me, that penetrates the mind of every Palestinian man, woman, and child, that encourages them to horrific acts of violence and cruelty. It is also the glory that they receive, the official celebration of terrorist attacks, the naming of roads, schools, and parks, and athletic events in their honor, the pensions they are paid, and the money that is paid to their families, all of which incentivize violence. Of course it does. And where does the money come from? The money that's used to fund and encourage terrorism, including the anti-Jewish propaganda, it's from your taxes and my taxes. That's where it comes from. Paid over by our leaders who are eaten up by a blind determination to appease. We, the people, have become the unwilling funders of Islamic terrorism against the Jewish state. The sordid, shameful story is also being played out at a higher strategic level. Each time Israel has made concessions to her enemies, they have become more aggressive, not less aggressive. Israel withdrew totally from southern Lebanon, Sinai, and Gaza. For her trouble, even today, she is being attacked from all three of those territories. Today, in a desire to appease the Arab world, as well as their own Muslim populations, the United States and Europe are trying to force Israel to withdraw from the West Bank and the Golan Heights, even without any concessions for peace by the Palestinians. They blame Israeli so-called occupation and settlements for a conflict waged by Arabs against Jews in Palestine that in recent times has been going on 
for more than 100 years, before there was an Israel, before there were any settlements, before there was any so-called occupation. They insist that Israel withdraws from the West Bank and the creation of a sovereign Palestinian state. They believe that those two things would bring peace, not just to the land of Israel, but to the whole region. But it is not in Israel's gift, ladies and gentlemen, simply to withdraw from the West Bank and end the so-called occupation. The reality is that Israel does not have a partner for peace. Not in the West Bank, not in Gaza. Nowhere among the Palestinian leadership is there anything that you could call a partner for peace. Israel made comprehensive effort offers to withdraw in 2000, 2001, and 2008. All of them were rejected out of hand by the Palestinian side. In the face of President Abbas's continued refusal even to meet Prime Minister Netanyahu to discuss peace, the Prime Minister has addressed him via YouTube, putting forward a five-point proposal for peace. And indeed, only on Thursday, Prime Minister Netanyahu extended the hand of peace to President Abbas at the United Nations General Assembly. A hand held out that will, without question, be rejected. But irrespective of any agreement with Abbas, with the Palestinians, an Israeli military withdrawal, as advocated by the United States and the EU, would be extraordinarily dangerous for the Jewish state. We saw what happened in Gaza since Israel withdrew from there. A hostile, uncontrolled West Bank would present a far greater threat to Israel than Gaza does. A truly existential threat. The greatest danger in the West Bank is not even the inevitable takeover by Hamas after an Israeli withdrawal. Both the Islamic State and the Ayatollahs of Iran aspire to move in to the West Bank and take control of any Palestinian state that is created there, to use it as a launch pad for the destruction of Israel. So whatever the Israelis do, whatever agreement they come to, whatever the Palestinians agree to, which is not likely to happen, but if it did, Israel still could not withdraw from the West Bank. If they did, they'd be committing suicide. They have to keep a military presence in the West Bank to defend their country and defend their people. And anybody who says they should withdraw from the West Bank wants to see the destruction of Israel. It is as simple as that. They may even not realize it, but they want to see the destruction of Israel. And that's what will happen if Israel withdraws in any circumstances that can be foreseen at any time in the future. In my opinion, not just in the next 10 years or 50, but the next 100 years, possibly the next 1,000 years. It is not credible that our political leaders, whatever we, we may think of them, do not understand the history and the present-day reality of the situation that I've described. So what is the explanation for their continued projection of this fantasy? Those three words, the three words, appeasement, appeasement, appeasement. Actually, it's one word, but its emphasis is with three words. Appeasement was behind the Middle East Peace Conference in Paris a couple of months ago. And that appeasement is doubly dangerous because it spurs on both the Palestinians and also French Muslims, both of whom have been given concession after concession, yet continue to attack. And there remains the real danger that President Obama will fail to veto a potential French or EU peace plan at the UN sometime this year before he leaves office, which will set out 
a timetable for the Israeli withdrawal and the establishment of a Palestinian state. Like all of the West's obsessive and habitual appeasement, this will lead to increase, just this failure to veto and this plan will lead to increased Palestinian intransigence, increased violence and, great, and more deaths. It will continue to give the Palestinian leaders hope that they can achieve greater and greater concessions, more and more money from Israel and from the West while making none themselves. This appeasement in the UN, which will sell Israel down the river, must be resisted by any of us who are able to do so at all costs. Appeasement cannot bring peace. If peace is possible between the Palestinians and Israel, and I'm not saying that it is, but if it is possible, then it can only be achieved from a position of strength, from a hard line, uncompromising stand. All of us here in this room care deeply about Israel, and we care deeply about the Jewish people. If we did not, we would not be here. But even those of our countrymen who do not share our pro-Israeli sentiments should be deeply concerned about the continued appeasement of anti-Israel jihad by many of our leaders. As the famous pastor Martin Niemöller warned us, and I quote, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. The situation is different in these days. The miracle of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, protected by the shield of David and the sword of Gideon, has ensured that though they might come for the Jews, they will not get the Jews. They're certainly coming for us as well. We have witnessed it in terrorism across the Western world since 9-11 and before most recently in the horrific attacks in France, Belgium, Germany, and the United States, even as recently as a shooting attack that killed five people in Washington State two days ago. And in an attempted Islamic State attacks that have been foiled in many countries, including here in Norway and in the United Kingdom. The time has come to end the appeasement, to be less tolerant, to make fewer compromises, to stand up for our values, for our civilization and for our way of life, for our way of life. To stand up to the horrors of the Islamic jihadists who would shame even the savagery of the medieval world. To stand in solidarity as you do, I know, with the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And I would just say on that point that it is not good enough just for us to stand in solidarity with the Jewish people. Not even an organization like yours, an extraordinary organization like yours, which has 11,000 members. You need more. We all need to do everything we can to build the numbers and to build influence among decision makers to stand up for the state of Israel and the Jewish people, to defend each other so as to ensure that it is not us, but it is those who want to dominate and destroy us who are defeated. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tusantak.